Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, as Julian said, my name is Maeve Smith and I work as a um, press officer with Trokra. I've worked at Trokra for um, a long time now and a few weeks ago I was asked if I would go to help the Caritas Confederation, of which Trokra is a part, to kind of support its communication capacity around the refugee crisis in the Balkans. So I went over to, um, I crossed three borders, and I'm going to talk to you about that uh, this afternoon. I, um, I went over and I spent about a week there. I went through um, Macedonia to Serbia, Serbia to Croatia, and Croatia to Slovenia, and tried to speak to um, refugees and workers and volunteers to find out a bit about the situation there capture some photos, some footage, and to bring a sense back that we could share that real individual sense we were talking about before lunch um, with people in Ireland. For me, um, I've obviously done assignments in different places like Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia, and it was unusual, if I'm honest, to be in Europe with a massive um, humanitarian crisis there. Um, it, it, it had a different feel to it and I mean when I was there the talk amongst people and um, workers there was around the largest shift of people since World War II. A whole region moving, escaping war. Some of the refugees themselves talked about their exodus, um, escaping that sense of movement and you could really get a sense of it um, when you were there. A number of things that struck me um, first of all, the sheer scale of it, standing amongst the refugees, the families, as they moved with all their belongings on their back, um, the whole spectrum of life there on the move in masses, as if somebody had, you know, they, they'd had enough, somebody had opened a tap and people just needed to get away from the horrors they were experiencing at home. Also, the, I guess, the demographics. So. It, when I was going over, <laughs> um, a lot of people, and obviously in the media, I was seeing uh, images of a lot of young men travelling over, and I thought that the majority of people, and I guess in a sense they are, were young men. But even when I arrived and I said that to one of my Caritas colleagues, I was asking about the type of people that were travelling, he almost looked a bit puzzled, um, because it was families, it was people from one to a hundred, uh, toddlers, mothers, fathers, everyone um, moving, so a real spectrum of people. Um, people who, I guess, uh, it was said that like kind of probably the more wealthier people are probably come to Europe at this stage, and this is almost like the second tier that is moving now. Um, people were connected, they were using um, technology to find out information about where they should go next, applications, and one of the, the refugee centres I was at, there was a really interesting Telecoms Without Borders service, which had brilliant Wi-Fi. I was able to get, you know, probably better Wi-Fi than here in, in DCU. People were able to use that service. People were organised. They were communicating, um, you know, and it was really, really clued in um, and really good to see. Um, another element that struck me was, I guess, the calm amongst the chaos of it all. So when I went into the refugee centres, if I was to try and put myself in that position, which I couldn't even imagine, to be honest, but I would imagine that I would be really quite, you know, stressed and, you know, probably angry. And But in the refugee centres, people just queuing really calmly, really polite, happy to talk um, or not to talk, but just very, you know, nice and happy to be in Europe, actually, happy to have finally got across those borders and now they're starting to see the finish line because I guess it would take a minimum for, of, of a week for them to get from somewhere like Syria to somewhere like Serbia and many of them have been travelling for a lot longer, you know, having stayed in Lebanon maybe or having stayed in Turkey. So uh, there was that sense of almost relief and being able to see that they were finally arriving in, in Europe. And finally, um, just to reiterate that pretty much everyone I spoke to was on their way to Germany. Um, like most people didn't have English, so I was kind of walking around asking for people if, you know, for anyone who could speak English. But uh, really that sense that they were going to Germany, some people to France, some people, I met a group of young people who were trying to escape being child soldiers in Afghanistan and they were going hopefully to Norway because they thought that it was safe for young people there. Um, but overwhelmingly people on their way to Germany um, and moving with a real kind of sense of you know determination and getting through each process as it came. 
So to give you a sense of who exactly is coming to Europe and why, so we've talked about all the figures. So who are the, the individuals like you and I that are behind all this? So Mohammed was one man that I met. Um, and as you can see there, he told me the Taliban said they would kill me unless I fought for them. They beat me with their hands, feet and legs. I've traveled by car, by donkey, by boat and by ship for 43 days. So Mohammed was a nurse in working in the local hospital um, in his town at home. And as he said, he was, he was told that if he didn't go and fight, he'd be killed. He was beaten up quite badly. He ended up as a patient in, a, in the hospital that he worked in. He showed me the scars on his back, the operation that he had. He had, you know, stitches all down his back. And as soon as he was able, he had to leave. He had to leave his wife behind, his children behind and was visibly upset when I was asking him about his wife and children, how, you know, how were they? He was worried about them and he would hope if he got um, to seek refuge in Europe that he would be able to reunite with his family that he's obviously very worried about at this time. Another thing to say was I had to obviously work very quickly. So Mohammed there, you can see he's, um, he's outside a big white tent, which was the, the refugee, uh, the registration process. So just being mindful that people were moving and um, people didn't have time to stop around and chat. It's not, it wasn't like um, a kind of, none of the centres I visited were like kind of long term refugee camps as it were. It was transitional centres where people could move through, get registered, go on to their next stop. So really I was trying to respect that, let people talk to me if they could, making sure that they stayed with their families so that they weren't getting separated and they weren't losing their place in the queue, having travelled for so long. So Mohammed is one man I met. Medea from Syria. So Medea was a, a young woman from Damascus and she says we are running, running away from war. In Syria I was married but the army came and took my husband and I don't know where he is. He disappeared. So as Medea said her husband was gone. She has two young children. She left the children with her husband's parents and she's now on the way to Germany where her family are settled. And she would hope again for that reunification to happen at some point. She spent some time um, in Lebanon, a number of months there. And then she spent some time in Turkey as well. And she was on her way with the group um, to Europe. One of the things she said to me, you know, as a young woman, she said that like I've been sleeping rough on the streets on my way here. That's mainly where we sleep. And I mean, it's not something I like doing. It's actually quite scary. It's not something I'm used to doing. So that I could kind of relate to that. I'm sure it was, I've never obviously had to sleep on the street, but it, it seems like a very scary thing to have to face. Mohammed and his son Badengo from Syria. So these, um, this is a family from Aleppo. This uh, young man really kind of stayed with me. He was so articulate. He was so enthusiastic to talk. Um, uh, but it was very sad what he had to say. He, he basically said, he was very animated. He said, we were finished. He was always quite matter of fact in the way he was talking. He was like, we had a famous store. It was the biggest store. It sold clothes, porcelain. You know, they were doing really well. And then our home and our shop were bombed. It, they were totally destroyed. They, we could hear the bombing noises all the time. He was making, you know, the gestures to me about um, what the bomb sounded like. And he said, I don't want help or money. He was really saying, you know, we're fine. I don't want help or money. I just want to be continue my studies. That's all this young man wanted. Um, really bright fella, and uh, I would hope that he would be able to continue his education. Then Haleb, so it's worth saying, um, kind of to bring up this, obviously, this treacherous journey that many of the people have had to face. So Haleb is actually originally from Palestine, and she had moved to Syria and married a Syrian man. And she was traveling with really young kids um, and her husband, like small kids, and they'd all made this horrible boat journey. Um, they knew, obviously, about the situation with people dying in the waters. Um, and she said, I was very afraid in the sea between Turkey and Greece. It was a small plastic boat with 40 people. It was too small and the sea was choppy. And she was really saying it was really insecure and uh, quite a scary time for them. So to give you a sense then of the different borders, and then I'll bring you through um, the kind of process, typical process that a family would go through. So um, I went through uh, Macedonia um, to Serbia to a town called Preševo, which is where the main refugee registration centre is. Then I went up to the border of Croatia. I went through a town called Seed, and that has, at the time people were crossing, 
um, on a route called the Burkasavo Crossing, but that is now not being used at the moment. Um, refugees are going straight into uh, refugee centres in Croatia. Um, I went into the refugee centre in Croatia, which was called Apatovac, but now that's been moved to a different centre called Slovansky Blad. So that's, uh, things are changing all the time. It's quite a fluid situation. And then I went to um, Slovenia to a place called Dobova, which is the main um, refugee registration camp there or centre. So to take you through Preshevo, really, to give you an example of how things work. So in Preshevo, um, my colleague there told me that they'd had a quarter of a million refugees in the last four months alone. And really, it didn't surprise me when I saw the amount of people coming through. And I wasn't even there on the busiest day. So they would get 2,000 to 10,000 people a day. Um, the weekend before I arrived there, there was 10 to 12,000 people in one day. And my colleague Davor told me that people were queuing for three days to get registered. And there was no water, you know, very little for such an amount of people. Some women had, were fainting in the queue because they didn't want to lose their space. If they went to get food or water, they'd lose their space in the queue. So people were just kind of staying there and trying to hold their space. Um, and also that sense that they want to move on as quickly as possible. So you're going to stay about three hours max in Preshevo. You're not going to hang around for very long because you want to get on the bus and on to the next place. So when they arrive into the centre, um, basically you can just see this big, long, organised queue coming in from the border and it kind of snakes through the refugee area. There's, um, there's a, some tents there that people can have a nap in or sit down. There's some really basic washing facilities, no showers, so people probably haven't had a shower or wash in about a week at this time, you know, if not longer. Um, people are arriving, their shoes are all muddy, they've just had a long train journey, the kids are obviously tired and... You know, they're carrying loads of stuff, so they, they're just in this big, long, but, but organised queue. And they, as I said, very calm. So they might queue a bit more. So this is another section of the queue. It would be impossible for me to, to show you the whole queue. And then they go through the registration process, registration, you know, a kind of organised system where they go into a tent which has a number of desks and computers and the government officials are there and they take thumbprints and get the paperwork and uh, they're registered in Serbia. And then there's a desk um, which is run by Caritas and the Red Cross where people can get some food if they're hungry. So we're giving out with Caritas um, food aid, so bread, tuna, um, water, kind of something to kind of line people's stomachs essentially. There's a lot of toddlers there and you'd see women changing the kids just on the ground because there isn't really any facilities. So we're giving um, nappies, wet wipes, baby powder, um, juices for the kids and that sort of thing so that they can at least clean them up and keep them well. And then also hygiene kits uh, for adults as well because they haven't got to wash either. So just basic things people can take with them. They can use them there or they can take them with them um, on the bus. So this little chap here and his mum were just getting um, some food. And then they might sit down. This is like just sit down on the ground, eat, you know, try and regroup. Um, People, again, just to, to reiterate that they want to stay together. It's, so, it's such a chaotic uh, situation. They don't want to kind of the kids going off into a different area or anything like that. They all want to stay together. So that's really important for them. And then outside the centre, this is a, there's a big line of buses. So you get a bus sent to the Croatian border. And the buses, uh, people pay to get the buses. They're about €35. Euro. There's, some buses are, are on the make and they can be charging a bit more, but they're trying to clamp down on that. But uh, you get the bus then right to the Croatian border. Along the way, the Serbian police stop the buses and they check that everyone has been registered uh, appropriately. Um, so this is just outside the, the, the centre. And um, actually, I believe the town of Preshevo have been fine. You know, they, they haven't kind of kicked up or anything. They've been, I believe, you know, fine with uh, the centre and how it's all working and everything like that. So that's really good. So the next stop, the Burkasava crossing. So when I was there, People would get off the buses at the bottom of this kind of mild hill. Um, and you can see people walking up this hill here. So standing looking down this hill, um, which is on the border between Serbia and Croatia, you just see a bus arrive, loads of people get off. And this, this lady, I literally saw her get off the bus, get all their bags, and then start the walk, a three kilometer walk up this uh, low hill to the, the Croatia crossing. and. Um, when you get to the border then it gets a bit more organised, there's kind of 
different aid groups, volunteers, police there, um, tarpaulins, and then you arrive at the, the border crossing where you, you go through to the Croatian flag, you can or to the, to the Croatian side, and you can literally see the flag waving over the border. But it, that you really get a sense there, it's a country road, and you really got a sense of the flow of people there more than even in the previous place. It was quite dusty and um, people were moving quite fast. Then from there you go on to a Patovac refugee centre, so this was uh, people arriving and I guess, I mean, the temperature had dropped when we got here. Obviously, winter is a big concern um, for any refugees going into the Balkans now. People not having the right clothes, their shoes are all worn at this point. And for me, I really got a more of a wartime feel here. There was just, as you can see, families with everything, kids with their toys, dropping their toys in the mud. Um, trying to keep everyone together and it just it was a, it wasn't you know it was very calm but it was quite miserable to see all these families lining up and um, waiting to go into this uh, to this camp my colleague Margarita who's our humanitarian coordinator there with Caritas Croatia was telling me that sometimes people are so eager to get from the border that even though of, of Croatia and Serbia that even though it's a free bus they will literally just go and you walk 15 kilometers to this um to this camp because they just want to get there onto their next stop so bad and then they lose their shoes coming through the fields and they might lose some of their items and maybe the 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 women and children will get on the bus and the the man um, might decide to walk if there isn't space and then the women are waiting for their husband outside the camp and they don't want to come in even though you know they're really weary so um you know there's different situations like that going on but they're so eager to get there um some of the some of the things that we're doing there as caritas is um we were giving four thousand liters of tea a day so you can just imagine the sheer volume of tea. I know we all love tea here, <laughs> but this was a lot of tea. Um, but it's just really practical, comforting measures like this to keep people uh, warm, you know, very, very practical. But it was, you know, really, I saw people kind of queuing to get their tea, some new clothes and some, you know, sandwiches. So just really, you know, basic, but uh, basic comforts. Um, Opatovac was quite well organised in the sense that there was different groups and different sections to the area um, with different facilities. So you could have, um, you know, there was bedding there. You could stay for six hours in this camp. So if you arrived late at night, you could sleep over. But as I said, people didn't stay for very long. They really wanted to get on to their next, their next stop. So as I said, people from one to a hundred um, I met along the way. So Bibi Hal is Becky, who's 105 years old. Um, and I met her there um, in a Patovac and she'd had quite a day. She probably had become the most famous refugee in the world on that particular day um, because she'd been on all the, the news channels and everything. So when I met her, she was lying down having a snooze. Um, so I didn't want to take a picture of her in that particular way, but she was tiny and I believe she was, she was blind and, you know, she'd left Afghanistan with 17 members of her family. I mean, how bad must things be at home if you're 105 and you're going to leave? So I just hope she's doing well now, wherever she is. I hope she's reached where she needs to be. Then the bus to, so I, you can see all the processes even going through it. And this is only a short, short section of the journey. The bus to, or the train to Croatia, to Slovenia. So this is the train um, that pulls in from the Zagreb line in Croatia. It's on the Zagreb Ljubljana line and it pulls into a sleepy town in Slovenia called Dubova where the main um, refugee registration centre is then in Slovenia. You can see kind of people hanging out the windows. It was a big, long train, and it's just across from the refugee centre, so they can literally see where their next stop is from the window of the train. And again, people go through this registration uh, system. And when I was there, it was, it was probably like the weather this morning. It was lashing rain, it was miserable, it was muddy, um, it was windy, and... Um, uh, kind of tight security here there was um you know a lot of police when you were going into the center kind of a lot of police a lot of army more um probably heavier kind of uh more like riot gear almost on the police when you were in the registration center then in in earlier um in earlier centers um, and people are kind of after the register they're kept in this kind of holding area so it's a big white tent and they stand behind these um, these barriers. It's got a bit of an agricultural feel, I think. You know, it was a, you know, it's like an, an agricultural pen, as such. It's like a big tent, and people stay there, and they either sleep there or they get ready to move on to the next train. 
Um, and these two women were from Syria and they were waiting to get the train on then to the Austrian border. An interesting project that Caritas Hungary is doing, they had, Caritas Hungary had a really good um, medical kind of ambulance tent for refugees coming into Hungary, but obviously when the border closed, they were, there were no refugees to treat. So then they brought this to um, Slovenia. So this is a really, it's like a bright red emergency tent and they treat about 100 people a day there. Um, the, the health is actually pretty good. You know, people are coming maybe with a bit of fever, with colds, sick stomach, but nothing really major. Um, but you do get some cases, um, like this little boy here was getting his hand stitched, he cut it on a rock. Um, but the doctors are highly skilled. They're, they're doctors, but they also would speak um, Farsi or Arabic, so they're able to communicate with their patients. And um, one of the doctors I spoke to originally from Iran was telling me that, um, you know, you could see though, even though people's health is well, you could see that people were under stress for a long time at this point. He'd recently treated a man who was, he said he was literally on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He was so depressed and so down. And the best thing they could do with, for him was to try and get him onto the next train so he could have some control because he, they just said he was just had got into a total spiral of depression and going through all the systems and um, but it was an interesting project and you know good to be able to provide some basic medical care and then finally once you come through Dabrava onto the next queue in your endless I guess stream of queuing to go to Austria and from there the journey continues so thank you very much that's the end Mike. I think we might do questions after each yeah. because otherwise you have to move back and forth, oh, okay. which is maybe nice. Yeah. So we'll just take a few questions for me and then we will go to. So I'll do what I did last time. I'll come to you last and I'll start in the back. So anybody in the back? No? Nope. And there is, I see one hand raised there. Yeah? Are you able to see why those people want to go to specifically Western Europe rather than staying in Serbia or Croatia or Slovenia? Yeah. I, I, like, I think it was because they knew that Germany was definitely accepting um, a large number of refugees for the one, the, like the first part. So a lot of people knew that there was maybe, they'd heard that there was a, you know, an acceptance that there would be a number of refugees allowed to go into Germany. Um, and they wouldn't have as much information about other countries along the way. And then a lot of people I met also had family already in Germany. So they were trying to reach those family as well. So it was a mix of the two. And then the other countries, um, I met a guy going to France and he had family there and the young children I met, uh, the 13 and 15 year old boys from Afghanistan, had heard that Norway had good facilities for children. So people have different mixes of information, but people are listening and organised. So what was interesting was um, the Syrian refugees all knew that the border was closed before maybe other refugees had got that information. So they were really organised and they knew to avoid that route, but maybe refugees from Afghanistan were going up towards Hungary and then finding out that the border was closed and were being stuck there. So people are communicating and telling each other, I guess, where they're going and where's the best place to go and what routes are available and what um, what what they, services they can access. Was it communicating by some... Um, uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I was um, talking to people, they were asking about our Facebook and everything and I was giving them our Facebook address for Caritas and, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, people have all got their, their phones and uh, the same as you or I would, and they're using the, the telecoms. Some people, um, their phone, a real practical thing, like that boy, uh, Badengo, he wanted to show me pictures of his house. Uh, he said he had taken lots of pictures of his house that was bombed, but he said his phone had died. So he's hoping to email them to me at some point. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe just go here. Thank, thank you. Uh, I add for the reason how they choose to go to Western Europe because they know very well that in Eastern Europe the, uh, the hosting uh, situation is very bad and uh, 
government are very against their rights and against their situation. They know everything about political issue. They used to to leave uh, five years under war, and they know how the other country talk about them. When some country like Slovakia or uh, even Hungary talk about selected refugees, Christian only, not other, uh, they know everything about this. Mm. And uh, also another factor that in Germany or other Western country they have the family already. Mm. They have a network, yeah. network family. Uh, I finish with a very important uh, survey done in Germany by the government with the refugees, between the refugees. Nine of ten, they said they left Syria because they buried bombs. Even if it's very attractive and it's very sexy to say that it's uh, Daesh who is the cause, but they said the reality that they left Syria. Nine on ten, I mean, nine for one. They said they left Syria because the barracks bomb from coming from the region. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people spoke in a general, very general sense about um, being bombed um, when they're from Syria. Um, in terms of uh, ISIS, I heard people speaking about that. It was a group of young um, Yazidi men that I met who were on their way. Um, I think they were going to Germany as well, but they had talked about how they had to leave because of ISIS, and that was the reason why they were going. They, they actually said to me, you know, why, when I asked them, why are you coming? They said, you know why we're coming. And, you know, I did, you know, but, um, you know, so, yeah, just to finish. Okay, well, I think in the interest of time, because we are running a bit late, we might...